Hey guys, Mr. Bullock here looking at chapters three and four. I'm going to stick mostly to chapter three on this video on Africa. I'm going to run through a quick few maps. Feel free to pause the video anytime you want to or refer back to these as references. This is a political map of Africa. Uh, the only problem with this one is that we now know that Sudan has been split into North and South Sudan, and the civil war is still going on there pretty much. Here's a comprehensive map showing physical features and countries. Again, uh, our Sudan has not been divided on this map. This is echo regions showing uh, types of vegetation or things that grow in these areas, grasslands to rainforests to deserts, as opposed to climate showing us hot and arid, which is a very dry desert area to uh, temperate summer dry climates. These are sort of um, Mediterranean uh, climates up in here, uh, all the way down to again, hot and arid down further in the south. And our population density, you can see our areas along the Nile River, the north coast of Africa, here in western Africa, and these sort of population centers in Ethiopia and other parts around, uh, the, the, usually bodies of water. Okay, and here's our satellite view. Again, we can clearly see where the rainforested areas are versus the desert areas in the Sahara and down in the south. Okay, Victoria Falls is uh, way up north uh, at the headwaters of the Nile River. Uh, this uh, is the uh, river where David Livingston, uh, one of the famous explorers, English explorer, uh, renamed after Queen Victoria of England, is one of the most spectacular waterfalls in the world. But let's get to what you guys want to know more about, which is some of the things that are on the study guide. So Africa's got some problems. It's got a lot, a lot of resources, yet many, many countries there are extraordinarily poor. Uh, in fact, the term third world was developed by what we now refer to as third world countries to explain how far behind they felt themselves to be compared to other countries. And the reason for this is an unequal distribution of natural resources. Um, some areas have a lot, some areas have very little. Uh, even within countries, there are some regions of a country that have a lot of resources and those that have very little. Also, there's desertification going on. That's the uh, areas that are grasslands being turned into desert or forested areas being deforested, deformed, uh, and overgrazed. Uh, add into their drought and climate change as the climate continues to change and the Sahara is expanding. All these things are making life more difficult for parts of Africa. And finally, it's a tropical climate in much of Africa. And tropical climates, while warm and we think of being nice things. This is a problem because there are diseases caused by insects and parasites, things like malaria, sleeping sickness, river blindness. These are all big, huge problems in Africa, especially malaria. Moving on, climate and change continuing here. About 4,000 years ago, the Sahara really began to change. Uh, it has dried up. There's less rain. Uh, people move away. Uh, areas that had been uh, that we'll look at later, kingdoms that existed in uh, West Africa, uh, Ghana, Songhai, Mali, uh, that were big, huge trading kingdoms, these sort of come to an end as well. Okay. Altitude, you may recall from when we studied Latin America, has effects on um, uh, temperature and climate. And what that is is essentially as you go higher in elevation, you're going lower in temperature. We talk about that idea in terms of not just altitude, but also latitude. The higher the latitude, the further you get away either north or south of the equator, the lower the temperature, the higher in elevation, the lower the temperature. And there's diverse cultures there because of this diverse, diverse uh, landscape and uh, geography. Uh, it's difficult to travel. And as a result of that, People are isolated. This results in thousands of language and lots of cultural differences. Okay, we're back looking at uh, Africa, the First Kingdoms. In this case, we're looking at the uh, Egyptian kingdoms. Now, for us, we think King Tut over here, um, Africa, Egypt, that is. And he's the most famous to us because we found all this stuff. He's actually a minor sort of nobody king, but he's the guy we know. Okay. More important than that are these kingdoms that existed, okay? because the history of Egypt is divided into the Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, and the New Kingdom. Okay. Here are the time frames here. I'm not going to make you memorize these, but dating back to 20, over 2500 BC, BCE, Before Common Era, uh, the Middle Kingdom 2000 to 1640 BCE, and the New Kingdom, we're still talking about things 15 to 1000 years before Christ, Okay, so a long time ago. Um, the power of Egypt eventually comes to an end with this conquest by Alexander the Great, who predates the ancient Greeks, 
and Alexander, uh, after he is gone, uh, later Egypt will be taken over by several other groups, primarily the Romans as well. Now the Egyptian kingdoms, uh, Egypt is centered on the Nile River. Uh, it has a river that floods annually, which enriches the soil. We think of floods as being bad. Flooding there is good because it was predictable. They knew yearly when it was going to happen. It fertilizes soil. It helped keep it rich uh, for them to produce agriculture. Their pharaohs are viewed as gods on earth and creates a sort of religious uh, type government, almost a theocracy in fact. And there is a great importance in ancient Egyptian kingdoms in the afterlife. Everyone's centered on this. Why do we have these mummies and these elaborate burial systems? Because we're preparing this body for what they see as the afterlife, this next world, where they're going to need all those same things. And the higher you are in status, the more things you are going to need in the next world. Okay. Ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics, um, really any system of writing in which pictures are used to represent an object is called a hieroglyphic system. Now, this is an example of Egyptian hieroglyphics. This is a pictogram, what hieroglyphics are. This is commonly associated with ancient Egypt and the ancient Egyptian language, but it's not specific to it. That is to say, any um, ancient civilization that used pictures to represent words is also using pictograms or hieroglyphics. Okay. Now, how can we read Egyptian hieroglyphics? It's because of the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone was found by a French officer of Napoleon. Yes, Napoleon Bonaparte, he of the uh, hand in his jacket. Uh, found these in a stone near the city of Rashid, which is, they referred to as Rosetta in Egypt in 1799. Uh, and here is the stone here. Uh, what it has is the same passage written in three different languages. which is inscribed back in 196 BCE. They had three languages, sort of, uh, I think, believe, uh, ancient Egyptian, uh, Coptic Greek or ancient Greek, and ancient uh, Amerian. Uh, and between these three, what they could do is figure out, that, hey, this is the same text. And once they could figure out that, they figured out the key to the hieroglyphics. Uh, speaking of the afterlife, this is uh, a a picture from uh, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which is explaining what happens and how you're being judged in the afterlife. Okay, now Africa ends uh, after the Egyptians kind of fall apart. One of the groups that will later take on, uh, take over, for, that is, after uh, Egypt falls, uh, is the Kush Empire uh, at about 750 BCE. These guys developed iron weapons after Assyrians coming in from the Middle East had invaded. They learned that technology and take over. They collapsed around 1000 CE, common era, or AD 1000. Uh, and then later we have uh, the country of Axiom, which is a little bit further down. Uh, this is uh, Kush, some um, temples and stuff that they had there. Um, let me get that out of the way here and make that one go away. And then the kingdom of Axum, which is a little further, and actually then will extend up the river and in, eventually into all of what is Egypt. This became a Christian empire. This is today what is today modern day sort of Ethiopia. Um, it remained a Christian empire even during the spread of Islam uh, in the 600s across Africa and the Middle East uh, and remains so even today as a Christian country. Today, again, this is the country of Ethiopia. Okay, that's where I'm going to start, uh, stop, rather, uh, look at the Western African kingdoms a little bit later, uh, starting with Ghana and Songhai and Mali. See you then.